Hey, John here. Talking about the Z80 Retro Board. Here's a 3D view of what the board would look like after you install all the parts uh, and before you plug the uh, chips into the sockets like this, all right? So this is on the GitHub project page right here, right? So it's my my home page or whatever. My account on GitHub slash 2063-Z80. I'll put a link to this in the description of the video on YouTube. Uh, so you can not have to type all this stuff in all the time, right? So uh, why are we here, right? So before we dive in and start, you know, trying to write code, we need to know what the heck the code's supposed to do. Before we do that, we need to put together the, you know, the design and make sure we understand how the design works. Now, I'll observe that the entire system here was designed based around the needs of the CPU, the Z80 here, and what its control signals do, and what it expects of all the other chips that are connected up to the system in response to what the Z80 does with its control signals, all right? So to find out how that works, click on the Bill of Materials link, and then over here we have the data sheets for each of these parts, okay? Down here when you find the CPU, right here. Okay, here's the link to the manual for the Z80. And inside this manual, it includes a lot of stuff. Open with Firefox is what we want to do. All right, so scroll down, table of contents, blah, blah, blah. There are errata and stuff like that. Here we go, table of contents. We want to know what the pins do on the chip and what we're supposed to connect them up to. These pages over here that discuss the various timing uh, requirements for the signals are w in, in here lies all the secrets of what we need to do. All right. So let's first look at actually let's first look at a picture of the chip uh, logical block diagrams. We can get all on the screen at once here. Uh, here's the Z80. OK, and here's what all the pins are named and kind of what they all do. All right. So easy. First one, the address bus, right? Whenever the CPU wants to say, hey, I don't know the value of some byte in memory at address 1FC5, the binary value 1FC5, right? The binary value for that hex number will come out of the address bus. It'll assert, it'll, it'll, it'll deliver it out here. All the arrows pointing out means these signals come out of the CPU. And if it wants to read a, a byte out of that memory address, it will expect that the memory device will know and look up at the address that is on the address bus, find the byte at that address, and send it back on the data bus. Okay, the data bus, you can see these arrows all go uh, both ways, right? These are the only pins on the Z80 that are both input and output. And the direction in which the data flows on the data bus is under the control of these read and write signals over here, okay? When the data, when Z80 says read, it wants to read. It's from the perspective of the Z80, and the memory then would have to look up the value and send the data in on the data bus so the Z80 would get it. If the Z80 says write, it means that the Z80 is given an address and it's sending data out on the data bus, and therefore the machine or the device, the chip or whatever that has the uh, data in it for the address on the address bus has to take the data from the data bus and store it in there, okay? So this other C80 roughly controls and commands the peripheral chips that are connected up in the address bus and the data bus, okay? Let's take a closer look at the control bus over here, right? The system control lines here. There's an M1, MREC, IO rec, read, write, and refresh. Some of these we're not going to use for anything, okay? Refresh is used for dynamic memory. We're not using dynamic memory. It requires more work on our part. And in a small system like this, it's completely pointless in this modern day and age. We're going to use static RAM and completely ignore that signal, okay? That leaves us with MREC and, and M1 and these guys up here. The short of it is, whenever MREC is low, there's a bar on top of that signal, which means it's active when it's low or when it's grounded, and it's inactive when it's high, or when it's connected to 5 volts, because the Z80 is a 5-volt uh, system, okay? So what this says is whenever MREC is low, the address on the address bus and the data on the data bus is to be uh, exchanged with memory peripheral devices, okay? So if it says MREC is low, IO REC has to be high, okay? We'll get to that in a minute. And read is low. That means I want to read from the memory. 
Okay, just like I said before, address goes out to the memory, and the Z80 says MREC and read, and therefore the memory needs to respond and send data on the data bus because the CPU wants to see it. If the ZPU says MREC is low and write is low, then the Z80 is saying, here's an address, and I, here's some data that I want you to store in the memory at the uh, address on the address bus. All right, it's as simple as that. IO REC is a different, a little bit different animal, and it gets complicated by the fact that it's used during uh, multiple different, it has two different roles depending on what the CPU is doing, okay? In the simplest of terms, what happens is the Z80 differentiates between interactions with memory and interactions with I.O. devices, okay? So you can think of this as having basically two different address spaces. Whenever the Z80 says I.O. rec is low and it's reading, the address on the address bus is referring to the I.O. device address. It has nothing to do with memory. Okay? If it says I.O. rec and it says writing, again, the address refers to an I.O. address, not memory. And the read and write still have the same meaning down here on the data bus. So it's going to say I.O. read. The Z80 wants an I.O. device to put data on the data bus so it can capture it. It wants to read from an I.O. device. Or if it says I.O. rec is low and write is low, and then the, it's going to be sending data out of the data bus to a I.O. device. Okay? Now, M1 and this weird relationship between M1 and I.O. rec will become more obvious when we talk about interrupts and how they're handled. And that's quite a ways down the road. We can write an entire CPM BIOS implementation and run it and play games and run WordStar and everything without even using interrupts, okay? But eventually we're going to want to use interrupts. And there's a subtle relationship between the M1 and the IO rec signal. And we need to take this into account when we design our schematic so that if and when we want to use interrupts, we haven't done anything that would prevent us from being able to do that, okay? And unfortunately, that's why we will have to talk a little bit about M1, okay? Uh, I'll leave that go until we get to the ne next part of the manual where they have a narrative that talks about this, okay? The CPU control lines over here tell us the state of the CPU and lets us control the state, right? Reset should be the easiest one. Whenever reset is low, we're asking the Z80 to reset itself. It's as simple as that. When it's high, the Z80 is running. And okay, the arrow's pointing in, so that's an input to the Z80, all right? All these lines up here, notice these were all outputs, okay? So this is the first one we're talking about where we actually control the Z80 as opposed to it crawling us. What else is in here? Non-maskable interrupts. We're not going to use those in our design. Normally what those are for is things like the power is about to go out. You have two milliseconds to wrap up what you're doing before you get the rug pulled out from under your feet. That's the kind of thing you use this for. Regular old interrupts are, uh, as the name difference in names suggest, are maskable. In other words, they can be enabled and disabled at will so that the Z80 can say, I don't feel like servicing interrupts right now, and it can disable them for as long as it wants, and then later on it can turn them back on and deal with them then, all right? As you can see, there's a difference in kind of role here. If the power's going out and the Z80 has to react right now, no matter what, without any concern whatsoever to what it's doing, that's the non-maskable <laughs> interrupt that we're not going to use in this project design. We're going to just tie this signal high and leave it there and ignore it. The interrupt signal we're going to use because uh, eventually we'll want to use it to let us know things like someone just pressed a key on a keyboard, and, you know, now would be a good time to go out and read from the console device or, you know, maybe a timer just expired. We want to keep track of what time it is, right? You know, the real time clock, how many seconds have passed since the uh, Z80 was last reset, that sort of thing. Okay, that's what uh, we're going to use interrupts for. Wait is a signal we're not going to use at all. It allows us to halt the CPU very briefly from time to time if we decide something like, you know, the MREC has gone active and it wants to read from memory, but the memory is not ready. 
Okay, it takes too long. The memory can say, wait a minute, I, I, I need to finish what I'm doing here. Just, just wait. And the Z80 will sit there waiting, and then the memory can finish doing whatever is causing it to run slow, and it can then un, uh, de-assert the weight and bring it high and let the Z80 continue on. Okay, we're not going to use this at all. Uh, in the 1970s, that might have been kind of necessary in some cases. In our case, absolutely not. Our memory is going to run like three times faster than the Z80. We're never going to have to wait. So just like NMI, we're going to just tie that high. Okay. Halt is an output that is uh, uh, true to let us know, if we care, that the Z80 has in fact halted. And what that means is that the Z80 will have executed an, uh, a halt instruction. So this is under kind of software control. We can halt it by just simply executing an instruction called halt. And it'll cause the Z80 to stop running until either an interrupt occurs or a non-maskable interrupt occurs, all right? If there's nothing to do, you can just simply halt the CPU. Otherwise, it'll spin like crazy and usually execute a tight little loop of instructions saying jump around in a, in a circle back to yourself doing nothing, okay? On uh, some systems, this is useful to let, uh, you know, uh, interrupting devices know that they're free to uh, send interrupts now. It would be a good idea. It would be a good time to do so. Or other systems to analyze what the CPU is doing and stuff like that. Okay, we're not going to use it. Okay, we're not. So far, we're not using refresh. We don't care about halt. We're never going to ask it to wait. We're never going to ask it to perform a non-maskable interrupt. Okay, and we'll only use interrupts down the road when we get to the point where we know how to program the peripheral chips for the Z80. Okay, so that's a couple of videos down the ways here. Okay. What else do we got here? CPU bus control, bus rec and bus AC. Bus rec goes into the CPU, AC comes back out. Short of it is, any device anywhere at any time can say, hey, Mr. Z80, I want to take over control of the machine. And the Z80 will finish up what it's doing and then acknowledge back, okay, do whatever you want. Okay, and when bus act goes active, and these are all have bars in front of them, so that means that when it goes low, it's acknowledging that the bus rec uh, has been recognized by the, uh, the CPU. And when bus act goes low, what it's saying is uh, that an external device can take over the control of M rec, I O rec, read write, all the address lines, and all the data lines. Okay, it's basically saying I, I'm gone hands off here, guys. Take over control of the of the buses, and we're going to use this to program the flash in circuit. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to build a, a like, like a seven dollar uh, little add-on board that we can stick in here, so we can program the flash without taking the chips in and out and bending all the pins and causing all that annoyance. Okay, so what's going to happen is our little flash programmer is going to say bus request, and when the Z80 says okay, you got it, what what's going to happen is the flash controller will take over control of the reading and write controls, the addresses and the data lines, and tell the flash to store new values in it. It, it. it will be able to erase it and load data into it. And when it's all done, it will release the bus request and then let the Z80 run the new code that we just put in there, okay? Which will be pretty fun. A simple little thing. Uh, again, it's sort of like if you've ever programmed an Arduino Uno, it'll work a lot like that, okay? There's the master main system clock, okay? Every time this ticks, we move in what's called 1T state, as we'll see in some timing diagrams below. Uh, this causes the CPU to actually do something, right? It's the main metronome of the whole system. This is going to be where we're going to connect up our 10 megahertz system clock. It needs 5 volts to power the CPU, ground, okay, in order to make it go. And that's really all you got, okay? That's really all there is to it. Our job now is to orchestrate the activities on our board using these system control lines, okay? And luckily, we get to ignore refresh. So we only have to deal with these five signals here, okay? Let's scroll down here. Down here, they actually give you a narrative description of each one of the pins that I basically just gave you. Now, when you read these, like IO request, 
This is the kind of thing that you're going to see in here. If you work ahead and you start worrying about wait states and refresh and stuff like that, which we're going to ignore those, there'll be a lot of narrative down here in there. And it could serve to confuse you. So luckily for us, if you want to go ahead and read this, I encourage you to do so. You'd be a fool not to. If you really want to mess around with this design, uh, you need to know all this stuff. Uh, the point is you can ignore a lot of stuff because we're not using all the features. But one thing that you do need to know is remember I said that something about the IO request and the M1 signal playing some games that have to do with interrupts, okay? And this is going to come back to haunt us when we look at the timing diagrams, okay? And here's the IO rack, and here's the M1, and they both kind of refer to each other, okay? And this is the M rack. What does it do? It indicates the address is a valid value for a memory read or write operation. There's no shock. An I.O. rack, other than this exceptional condition down here, will say the same thing. It in indicates that the lower half of the address bus holds an I.O. address for a read or write operation to an I.O. device, okay, instead of memory. Now, notice that this says the lower half of the address bus, okay? Let's come back up here. Address bus has 16 bits in it. This is 64K of memory. 2 to the 16th power, 64K combinations. Now, when you're addressing the memory, the entire address bus is used, and every byte in the memory could have an address from either from 0 all the way up to in hex FFFF. Okay? But if you're doing an I.O. operation, it only says the lower half. We don't pay any attention to the high address bits when we're dealing with an I.O. device, we only care about the bottom eight bits, okay? And we're going to see that when we say, uh, when we look at the circuitry that says, you know, uh, the CP wants to do an I.O. operation, which I.O. device is supposed to be used. What do I want to enable? Do I want to talk to the serial controller or the I.O. controller? Maybe he's talking to the printer now. What is he using, right? Well, that is going to be the number that's on these eight bits here. We are going to completely ignore the ones up here when we're doing I.O. operations, okay? And you'll see that in the schematic. You need to keep that in mind. Otherwise, you can complicate things and things break. Uh, reading means it's going to be reading. Writing means it's writing. Reset. There's a little note in here that says, you know, what, what does the reset really do? It clears various registers. It, it sets the program counter to zero, Okay. Uh, during the reset, it enters a high impedance state, and blah, 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 blah. Reset must be active for a minimum of three full clock cycles in order for this to basically work, okay? Well, that shouldn't be hard. It's three ten millionths of a second. We need to make sure the reset signal stays on that long, okay? And it turns out it's not that hard to do. But we build a little special circuit that we'll look at uh, to do just that. Now, refresh we're ignoring, wait we're ignoring, write we already talked about, clock is the main system clock, single phase MOS level clock, as a highfalutin term that just says this thing needs to generate a square wave that's 5 volts when it's high and 0 volts when it's low. Okay? And it has to run at a speed that is acceptable based on the Z80 that you buy. And the way the Z80s are set up, they can run anywhere from zero hertz up to the specified maximum. And I'm looking at 10 megahertz for the chips that I got, okay? You can run it slower if you want. Uh, and this down here gives you a little narrative that reminds you that if there's a bar on top of a signal like right with a bar on it like this, it means that it is active low. And in other words, it's, when it's ground, it is true, okay? Not when it's at 5 volts, okay? Now, why they didn't put the bars over here on these, honestly, I find that annoying in a manual. Just, if RFSH is active low, I expect to see a bar on it all the time, not some of the times. Keep in mind what you're looking at here. Don't get confused. All right? Now, the timing uh, discussions here, they talk a little bit about, they define what an M cycle is and a T cycle, and we care because this tells us exactly how we're supposed to use the signals we just saw above. All right? So let's look down here. What is it talking about? This is your 10 megahertz clock. 
tick, 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 tick. Each one of these is 10 millionths of a second. What happens when you execute one single instruction on a Z80? Well, if the instruction has an opcode and it has to read something from memory and then do something and then write something back out to memory, it will run like this. Some ticks uh, go by during what it calls machine cycle number one. An M1 is a, uh, an elongated cycle, we'll see the details in a minute, that is uh, performed by the CPU when it fetches the very first byte of a new instruction that it's getting ready to execute. Okay, These other cycles are optional and may or may not exist depending on what the instruction does. Some instructions, like if you were to OR one register with another register and store the results in a register, it doesn't need to read more memory or doesn't need to write memory. It all takes place in one single M1 cycle. So these other ones may or may not be necessary is the point. Okay. Now, this is not a huge deal while we are looking at the schematic right now. This is just, you know, get your mind on what this machine does so that we can understand the timing diagrams. We really need to understand M1 when you're working with a Z80 so that when you build your circuits, they know when to respond to I.O. requests and memory requests and stuff like that. All right. So it doesn't confuse the, uh, the chips on your design. So here it describes what it does when it does an, an instruction fetch during the M1 cycle, okay? The program counter is put on the address bus. Well, that makes a lot of sense, because what does it mean to execute an instruction, right? It means go out and get the byte and out of memory at the address that's in the current program counter. So that makes perfect sense that that was what it will do right at the beginning of the M1 cycle. One half a clock cycle later, it asserts MREC, and that makes sense, right? Because it needs to read from memory at the address that's the program counter. And then it says what? Then it waits a little longer because the, I mean, we're dealing with reality here, right? Laws of physics come into play here. It takes time for the voltages on all the address lines and even the MREC signal to change from being inactive to active. And they have to stabilize. That's one of the words we use because the address lines may all kind of uh, you know, jumble around a little bit, right? And you remember in the overview, the introduction to the series, the, the, the giant S100 card that I made back in the day, I had all those wires all bundled together. And I said, it's a miracle that board ever worked. Well, the reason it worked is because of this right here. It's because what happens in a Z80 during the M1 cycle and all memory cycles, in fact, what it does is it asserts the memory request signal and then it waits well, and relatively speaking, a pretty long time. So that if somebody like me build a crummy board or use chips that were too slow, they have to wait until all the noise and crosstalk and all that stuff stabilizes out and stops happening before it actually uh, does the data exchange, okay? And uh, uh, what does it say? So it waits for the memory before it asserts the memory request. And then it waits a little while longer, and it talks about dynamic memories needing a long time, because they do. We're using static, so we don't care. Uh, then, uh, so after a while, after it asserts MREC, it'll assert the read line, finally and at long last. And then it waits a little bit longer, and then it shuts off the read line and the MREC and all this other stuff, uh, uh, because it has given the, the memory device enough time to send the data back and it has captured it and it starts evaluating it and deciding what to do. Okay. Now it talks about when the CPU actually moves the data over the course of time and gets a lot of details in here. But if you look at this diagram, it all is given right here. All right. So what we're looking at, this is the M1 cycle only. Okay, this is a super zoom in. What does it mean to fetch the first byte of an instruction? Okay. Well, here's your 10 megahertz clock clicking away. The address bus, all 16 bits, the program counter value is placed on the address bus. So the A0 A to 15 equals PC right now. That's what this means, all right? Later on, it's going to do this refresh stuff that we don't care about, okay? We only really need to make sure this works. So what does it mean? Program counter goes on the address bus. It gives it a little while. We call that the setup time. It lets the, pro the address bus... 
uh, stabilize and set everything up so anything that's looking at this bus will see a stable value by that time MREC falls, we say here, becomes active, okay? At this point, we know the program counter, even if there's all this interference and you made a crummy board, it'll be settled down by the time we get to here. That's why that board worked, okay? <laughs> now, coincident with this, it also asserts the read signal to let the peripheral memory devices know that they are supposed to send data to the CPU as opposed to the other way around. Okay, now it gives it, relatively speaking, even at 10 megahertz, an eternity to respond. Okay, this is what, a hundred and some odd nanoseconds. The memories that we're going to use, even the slow, crummy ones, are going to be way better than a hundred nanoseconds. Okay, so we don't have to worry about making it wait. And what you see down here, here's this wait signal we're not going to use. And the way you read this is it says, I don't care, the Z80 doesn't care what the wait signal is over here. It could be high, it could be low, it doesn't matter. It doesn't care what it is over here either. It could be high, it could be low, it doesn't mean a thing, except for right here. If and only if, during the falling edge of time state, uh, T state number two here, during opcode fetch, is when the Z80 actually looks at the value of this signal. It ignores it all other times, okay? If and only if the wait signal is high during this time, the CPU will not wait any longer and immediately proceed on to time state number three by capturing the data that's on the data bus that it asked the, uh, the memory uh, to provide so that it can read it because it asserted read and MREC at the same time up here, okay? So we're not going to ever lower it. Therefore, this diagram works exactly as drawn because this is high during this period and otherwise, you know, it's high all the time in our design, okay? Here's this M1 signal over here. Notice it goes low at the beginning of T1, and it stays low until the end of T2. That's to let all the peripheral devices know that this memory transaction that's taking place here is part of an opcode fetch, should any devices care. And there's only one case when we actually do care, okay? And that has to do with this interrupt stuff in the I.O. processing. So you'll see this come back up in a minute. For now, we don't really care because the memory responds because MREC has become active and read is active. That means the memory is going to go take the value out of its, its storage area at the address of the program counter, put it on the data bus, and the Z80 will take a little quick peek at it while the end of T2, this rising edge right here of the clock signal, that's why they draw it this way. That's the actual point in time when the Z80 captures, we say, the data from the data bus. It doesn't care what it is before here. doesn't care what it is after here. It's only going to look right here. Okay? Now, part of the opcode fetch, right? When you, when, you, when you study, you know, how do computers work? Well, what do they do? They fetch an opcode. They decode the opcode. Then they ex execute the operation that's been requested. So what happens on a Z80, the M1 cycle, whoa, I can't get the scroll to work right on this thing. Hello. I guess the arrow keys are a little more. Okay. Uh, so what, what the Z80 does is it takes advantage of the fact that there's the fetch, right? It does take two whole clock cycles for the Z80 to decode the opcode and decide what to do. Now, Back in the late 70s, static RAM was really expensive. Dynamic RAM was much cheaper. And in order to use dynamic RAM, you needed to do various things. You have to refresh it all the time, and you have to generate special count values and control it in a certain way to make sure it doesn't forget what was stored in there constantly. It has to constantly be refreshed. And the designers of the Z80 knew all this, and they knew that a lot of people that use Z80s will use dynamic RAM. So what they did is they built in to their uh, M1 cycle during their opcode fetch and decode, and that's the key here. Z80 has to waste these two clock cycles anyway. So just for fun, they said, fine, if you have dynamic RAM, we will reassert MREC right here with a special address to say, now is a good time to refresh your dynamic RAM if you have it and care. 
Notice M1, MREC goes active, but read is not active. They don't even show the right signal on here, which is sort of annoying, but uh, I happen to know, and the implications are that the right signal is high the whole time. There are no operations during the M1 cycle that writes any data anywhere. Okay. So what happens? We got MREC goes active, but we're not reading and we're not writing. That's the special cue when we have refresh active. Okay. Refresh goes active. MREC is active. We're not reading. We're not writing. The dynamic RAM says, aha, this would be a good time for me to do my refresh cycle because that takes time. And if it does it right here in no other time, it won't cause the system to slow down. All right. So that's what's going on in here. We don't care. We're ignoring the refresh line. We're not going to do anything in this time period. Okay. We only need to understand that MREC can go active when, when we don't want it to. That's the key here, okay? MREC can go low, but without read being active and without write being active. So we need to make sure that our circuit can deal with this and not, you know, delete memory or do something wonky, all right? That's why we need to pay attention to this just in, just to make sure we don't accidentally do something stupid. Okay, so this is what happens when it reads a, 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 a byte of memory for the purpose of fetching an opcode in M1 cycle. Now, all the other cycles are described as regular old memory reads and writes, and in this narrative somewhere in here, it says, well, when you do a read, it's really doing the exact same thing as it does during a, a fetch cycle. And that's really nice and convenient because we wouldn't want to have to build a circuit that does one thing during M1 and a completely different thing during all the other cycles, right? So in order to transfer data from memory, whether it's M1 cycle or not, what we need to do is say MREC is low and read is low if it wants to read out of memory, and MREC is low or write is low if the Z80 wants to write into memory. And everything else doesn't really matter, whether it's during M1 or, or, uh, or any other time. And as long as we use this combination, literally, as I just said, when MREC is low and read is low, do this. Or if MREC is low and write is low, do something. That excludes this case over here because MREC is low and read is not active, nor is write. So this is another case. As long as we do it the way I said, we're fine, according to this paragraph right here, okay? And then it goes on to talk about the right cycle, blah, blah, blah. And now, we didn't look at a right cycle yet, but it talks a little bit about what's going on. And again, it makes special thing for dynamic RAM. We don't care, okay? Here's what a read looks like. Uh, or rather, a yeah, here's a memory read cycle followed by a memory write cycle, okay? So just like you saw during opcode fetch, we're not going to see M1 in here because it suggests here that M1 is either a don't care situation or it's always high. Okay. We know that we're not using weight. In our system, weight will always be high. So the only time it cares are here and here. And as long as it's high, at least during these times, it won't cause the system to slow down which is our situation. Now, notice what I said earlier. If you've got a memory address on the address bus and MREC is low and read is low, then we are going to read from memory. Okay, and this tells you again, this is when the Z80 is going to look at the memory bus. We have all this time to react to the address and the fact that, you know, if we're a memory chip, we get, uh, you know, almost two whole clock ticks, 200 nanoseconds, an eternity in computing time to respond and get our data ready and onto the data bus so that when the Z80 looks and takes a peek on the falling edge of T3 right here, our data is ready to go. And we have no problem meeting these timings, okay? With modern chips, this is not a problem at all. In 1975, maybe you could get some, there were like some EPROMs and stuff that took like 250 or 300 nanoseconds. Uh, but then again, the CPUs were only ran at 2 megahertz, at which point you had, you know, 500 nanoseconds to do it. This is generally not a problem, okay? So here's our first view at the write cycle. Notice the only difference is that MREC does go low, just like it did for the read cycle. But instead of read being low, write goes low. And notice a little bit of a timing difference here. And it makes sense, right? If there's going to be data coming out of the Z80, 
The Z80 puts the address on the address bus, it asserts MREC, and it also puts the data on the data lines before it tells any of the memory chips that they're supposed to save the data that's currently on the data bus in the memory, okay? And in this case, with our chip, we're going to have 100 nanoseconds to react if we uh, have to do so during this write operation, when the write is low, right? And what this says is it guarantees that the Z80 puts the data on the bus before the write goes active, and it keeps it there a little while after. Again, this is why my spaghetti bowl board worked, okay? Why? Because the addresses were stable long before they needed to be. The data was on there and stable a long time before they need to be as well. So very little is changing on the Z80 and the control buses and anything in the entire system once we get past this point right here. The only thing that happens is one and only one little signal in the entire system goes on and then back off again. Well, everything else is stable and steady. That's what you want. That's the optimum situation. Huge setup time. Do what you're going to do. Huge hold time afterwards, all right? This is a dream. <laughs> you don't have any problems. Now, those are all memory cycle operations up here, okay? Let's look at the I.O. cycles now. They're going to look a lot like the memory thingies, but instead of MREC, we'll see IO rec. But there's a minor twist that has to do with those interrupt thingies, okay? Because during an interrupt cycle, you will see that it abuses the IO rec line. It, this does play a little bit of a role. So what are we looking at here? What's this one? This is an input or an output cycle. Now, unfortunately, and I object to this diagram, look what happened in here. They're, this di they, they hired a new art director after they finished whatever, page 24, before they did page 25. This one, their memory read cycle is on the left, and then on the right, there's a completely independent set of three states and talks about a write cycle. Okay? Now, down here, this diagram has only one cycle in it, and it shows what happens if you have a read cycle here. Okay, and when you're looking at a read cycle, you ignore this down here. But when you're looking at a write cycle, you look at this, and then you ignore this, right? I, you know, seriously, it would be nice if they were consistent across one page of the manual, <laughs> but no. <laughs> All right, so in your head, don't get confused. What they should have done in this manual is drew out the uh, input cycle over here and the output cycle on the right. And what they did is they did it vertically instead of horizontally. All right, inconsistency drives me nuts. But let's look and see what's going on now that we are aware of that. And that's what they mean by this little notation over here, okay? And you'll see this works very much like the memory. Uh, before we get into any of the details, you'll notice that the data bus is active and valid way before the write signal goes on and stays active after it goes off, just like we saw up here, okay? When it's doing an output operation. When it's doing an input operation, it waits and gives the device, the memory, whatever it's reading from, whatever it's inputting from, a long time to get ready, and then it takes a quick little peek at it during the falling edge of this cycle right before these things go back high again, all right? Again, that's exactly the same kind of thing that happens over here during a regular old memory read cycle, okay? Now, uh, what what's different and what's interesting about this? Well, instead of MREC going low, IOREC goes low. But all the other stuff, kind of, it all works the same way. And I say kind of, the only real difference is the Z80 slows everything down during a, an I.O. request and adds one wait state cycle in here just to waste time. And the reason it does that is because back in the day, everything was slow as heck. And it really needed this in order to provide the average peripheral chip to respond in time. And again, you have the wait state here that you can extend this and make it wait arbitrarily long if you want to. Again, we're not going to do that. We're going to tie this high. So our signals will look exactly like this. All right? So far, so good. Not bad. When IO rec is low, we're reading or writing. When MREC is low, 
were either reading or writing. Okay, and the address bus for um, memory transfers have 15 bits of significant meaningful values. And when we're doing I/O requests, uh, unfortunately, they labeled it uh, A0 through 15. This is either a typo or there's some subtlety. I'll leave it as a task to the viewer to notice that when you do an I/O operation, the High order address bus bits are used for something, but it's not an address. I think it repeats the value of the uh, data or some weird thing. We don't care about those bits, all right? But the Z80 does do something with them that, again, we don't care about, which is, I suppose, why they do this. Uh, honestly, I think this is just bad uh, doc on this particular page. Um, okay, so there's an I.O. request, there's a memory request. Now, what they don't show in here, just like they didn't show it up here, is the M1 signal. And both of these graphs are only true if and only if M1 is high the whole time. Okay, especially this one here. Okay. The reason for that is on the uh, uh, one or two more diagrams down. We'll look and see what that's about, okay? There's the bus request and acknowledge cycle. As I said before, we're going to use this when we're going to program the flash uh, chip in circuit because we're going to have to request access to the bus. And it gives you a little signal uh, diagram here that says, if I assert bus request, the Z80 will react at the end of the current M cycle, even in the middle of an instruction, it will react, respond, and acknowledge that we've t I've taken over the bus. It will disconnect itself from the address data and these control lines so that we can do anything we want with them. Okay? When we're done, we can uh, de-assert and raise it back up again, and then the Z80 will say, okay, thank you very much. I no longer acknowledge that you're using the bus, and it'll go back and resume what it's doing over here. Okay, no problem. Here's the interrupt acknowledge cycle. We need to look at this before we design our board to make sure that we don't screw this up. Okay, so here's what happens. Notice that M1 is back on the graph finally and at long last. And here's the whole ball game. When M1 is low and MREC is not low, okay, we're performing this interrupt acknowledge cycle. So M1 is low, and I.O. request now is low here, okay? That is a weird thing. It's not fetching an instruction from an I.O. device, okay? What it's doing is it's initiating what's called an, I, an interrupt request uh, acknowledgement cycle, okay? And in this cycle... And we'll talk more about this when we work on interrupts, when we're working on our BIOS and we turning interrupts on the timer and stuff like that. But for now, all we need to know is that when we are enabling our I.O. devices to transfer data, we need to make really sure we don't accidentally do that during an M1 cycle. That's the whole point of this, right? Do not ever enable your I.O. device to transfer data on the data bus the I.O. devices, I say, during an M1 site, when M1 is low, okay? Just don't do it. Because what this means is this is a special, uh, special purpose thing during M1. If the Z80 says, okay, I'm going to do an I.O. request, that means that it's a private communication sort of off to the side. It's kind of off the books where a special Z80 peripheral, they're very... Uh, specific type of situation going on and the z80 family of chips all know to do this and they jump onto the cycle uh onto the bus during this special cycle and it can tell the z80 about the interrupt that is taking place so if a chip says hey i want you know assert the interrupt line and the z80 does this on its bus m1 is low io request is low that means that um the notice what's on the address bus up here. It's got the program counter for crying out loud. It means that the peripheral that is generating an interrupt is free to put interrupt information on the bus right now without any regard to the current value on the address bus. Okay, so we have to be careful here. Do not just assume that it's okay for an IO uh, device to transfer data on the data bus 
because IO request is low. That's not true, okay? It's only true if IO request is low and M1 is not low, okay? Now, they go on further to show that during this special cycle, read never goes low here. And, of course, they don't show it, which is minorly annoying, that write also never goes low in here. So we got this kind of a weird thing going on. It's sort of like the refresh cycle we saw earlier, right? In this case, M1 is low, and I.O. request is low, but neither read nor write are active in this time. That's the special cue to the peripheral devices that this is that special cycle, okay? We just need to make really sure that we don't accidentally uh, react during this time for any other reason, okay? And again, a quick refresher up here when we're looking at the M1 cycle there. And during this special refresh, remember, we saw, um, oh, that's not it at all. It's up here. We saw a situation where the MREC instead of the IORec went active without the read being active, and it implies that the write is also not active. So this is an MREC without reading and writing is a refresh cycle, okay? And an IORec during M1, all right, when the I.O. rec is active and you're not reading and you're not writing, this is this special acknowledgement cycle, all right? So armed with this information here, we know everything we, we, we take my word for it. We know everything we need to build a uh, the interface chips to hook up memories and stuff like that to our Z80. Now, you can scroll down here. I'll leave the rest of the reading for the viewer. Uh, there's all, all these other cycles, like what happens during a non-maskable reset? What happens during a halt? What happens when the halt is done? What does it do when you're powering it down? How it, does this work? How, all these other things that can happen, none of which we really care about in this particular design. What does it mean to enable and disable interrupts? There's all these other details in here, none of which concern us right now because we've already taken account the timing diagrams above so that we know when the memory chips need to be enabled, we know when the I.O. chips need to be enabled. That's the motive to understand those timing diagrams. Well, the clock on the wall says this might be a good time to take a break. Next time we come back, we'll start looking at the schematic and how we're going to implement the circuitry based on those timing diagrams, right? So thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you then.